So the psalm before us today is not the well, most well-known psalm. It's not necessarily a psalm that we might quote often. It's not a psalm that we would read at times when we need comfort like a funeral or to remind us of joy like at a wedding. Psalm 82 does not deliver us a warm, fuzzy message that we might cross-stitch on a pillow or put on an inspirational background. And as I looked at it for this week's message, I might even say that Psalm 82 is not a psalm for the faint of heart. However, despite all of that, at least one theologian claims that Psalm 82 is the single most important text in the entire Bible. It's a pretty big claim. This psalm lets us lean in and listen to the heartbeat of God. And this theme, which sounds out so clearly in Psalm 82, is actually a theme that is found all throughout the biblical story. So the psalm that we have before us is set in a heavenly council with God at its head, and that might be part of the mystery as to why such a foundational text in the theology of the Bible might get by with such little notice. Well, that, and I think it brings us a little bit of discomfort, so we don't like to dwell on it all that much. It's a little bit hard to know how to interpret the imagery in this text. <clears throat> and I did do a lot of reading on it this week, but I think what it boils down to, what this psalm most clearly shows us, is that God has authority over all the other leaders, all the other systems, all the other principalities and powers that might try to claim leadership on this sphere that we call Earth. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus gives to his disciples what's known as the Great Commission, and it is probably familiar to most of you. However, Jesus begins that commission to make disciples of all nations with these words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so I think that sums up one of the major points of this psalm. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to God. This psalm asserts the absolute supreme authority of God over every other ruler, every other supernatural power, over everything in the cosmos. And God, who has this supreme authority, has a particular judgment to serve up on those other powers that might compete for his ability to rule. And this is God's judgment. They are unjust, unfair, and they show partiality. One writer points out that this shows a leadership style that is opposite to the foundation of God's reign in the world as it is seen in the Jewish tradition. This clearly goes against the Old Testament articulation of God's law, where people of Israel are told by Yahweh not to render unjust verdicts or to show partiality. The judgment of the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth is that all the other powers that are in place fail to show justice for the oppressed and the disadvantaged in the world. One writer says the following. The writer of this psalm urges people to turn their eyes to Yahweh, who is above all of the cosmos and every nation on the earth. Therefore, Yahweh's justice must be opposite all others who would claim power for themselves. Yahweh must be a God of justice, righteousness, mercy, and compassion, the one who will rescue the oppressed. So all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to God, and God is a God of justice, righteousness, mercy, and compassion, and will rescue the oppressed. And that, as it turns out, is the very heartbeat of Yahweh. Psalm 82 says, defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. The prophet Micah puts the same words this way, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord des desire of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus said these words this way, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus also told his followers when he was asked what is the most important commandment, he replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. 
And later in the New Testament, James, who is rumored to be the brother of Jesus, writes for the early church, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So all throughout scripture, no matter what you call it, whether it's being faithful to God or being a follower of Jesus, whether you call it your religious commitment or your walk of faith, all of it implies not just believing something specific, but also committing to live out God's heartbeat for his people here on the earth. Loving God means loving other people and paying attention to how you treat them. And especially, loving God means paying attention to how we treat people that the world does not treat well. That's the point of this psalm. And that's the reason that at least one theologian calls it the most important text in the entire Bible. One writer says that while this assertion may seem strange, this theologian nevertheless has a very good reason for defending his theological claims. Justice. Because Psalm 82 asserts that justice makes divinity. God cannot be God, divinity cannot be divinity without the characteristic of justice. So justice is part of the heartbeat of God. It's a huge characteristic in the way Yahweh is portrayed all throughout the Bible. I saw the following um, from an African American on social media the other day and it captures the point that I'm trying to make beautifully. He wrote this, people ask me all the time about books to recommend as it relates to justice. And I'm completely honest when I say that being black in, and in America and reading the scriptures as inspired in light of those experiences has done more to shape my theology than any book. It's in the text. It's in the text, he says. Now, I will acknowledge that while that is all completely true, getting our fingers around what justice means is easier said than done. What does justice look like? That's another matter completely, because it looks different to different people. It prompted one writer to issue a word of caution about this psalm. He says, but one word of warning. Please do not assume that your pre-existing ideological commitments about justice are identical with those of Psalm 82 or the rest of the Bible. Too many interpreters of the Bible assume that the biblical admonitions for justice, and he puts quotation marks there, automatically line up with their personal views on contemporary justice. It's an easy word to say, justice, but it's a hard concept to understand and an even harder reality to achieve. So justice is the heartbeat of God, but it's easier to state that than to know precisely what it is we're meant to do about it. Another writer had some comments about the concept of justice that I wanted to share with you, and I'm quoting at length here because he has a lot of good thoughts. He writes, but do we even really understand what justice is? More importantly, do we view justice in the same way that God does? At its most basic definition, justice simply means getting what you deserve. By this definition, there are two main streams of thinking about justice. The first understanding of justice is that of the courtroom justice, vindication for an injustice or deserved punishment for a crime committed. We think of convicted criminals getting justice when the sentence is handed down to them. We believe in a divine justice when God will ultimately judge the living and the dead. This version of justice is demonstrated in the first two verses of our psalm here today. There God is placed as the judge in a heavenly courtroom. Our God is called up from among the other deities to judge the nations and to pronounce judgment on the wicked. And at our human core, we all long for this first version of justice. We want to see evildoers punished for their atrocities. We want to believe that people reap what they sow and will get what they deserve. We want to see people pay for their crimes and endure the consequences of their actions. Whether it is the Boston Marathon bombers or a child molester or a mass murderer, we demand justice. We may even comfort ourselves with the thought that in those cases, when people escape justice in this lifetime, they will ultimately face judgment in the life to come. We hope for a sort of cosmic karma. What goes around comes around. However, there is a shadow side to this version of justice. A consistent longing for this sort of justice can eventually turn into a twisted sort of vengeance. 
We think we know better than God, and so we frequently put ourselves in the judgment seat. How easily we forget that God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. That's in the book of Romans. Fortunately, there can be another way of thinking about justice. Looking at the definition, justice is getting what you deserve from an alternative perspective. Justice now becomes the idea that there are some basic human rights that all people are entitled to possess. Freedom, safety, dignity, equality, health, and love. In this line of thinking, justice is assuring that people are getting the rights they deserve. The second version of justice is also in Psalm 82, verses 3 and 4. Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the rights of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Here, justice is displayed as repairing broken systems, repairing broken relationships, and fixing things that are unfair, corrupt, or exploitive. This type of justice is often characterized by social justice, which Google defines as the distribution of wealth and opportunities and privileges within a society. John Wesley was a strong advocate for this form of justice, and Methodist leaders were among the first to work toward prison reform and to fight for the abolition of slavery. Wesley urged early Methodists to engage themselves in work, works of mercy by caring for the sick, visiting the imprisoned, feeding the hungry, and advocating for the poor, oppressed, and marginalized. In the church, we tend to view this second form of justice through the lens of salvation or redemption. The word justification might spring to mind. When we care for the poor, when we show concern for the orphan, we're acting redemptively, just as God has done in our own lives. Through enacting this kind of justice, we're able to participate in the mission of God, coming alongside God in the salvation of creation and humankind. It seems that in life, we more instinctively embrace that first version of justice, the demand for revenge and an eye for an eye mentality. But what if our initial instinct instead was for this alternate form of justice, the type of justice where we see every human being created in the image of God and that they should be given equal opportunity to succeed and thrive in this life? In this godly view of justice, even the homeless addict on the street deserves justice in the form of a hot meal and a warm bed. The Muslim Syrian refugee deserves justice through safety and security, not having to constantly live in fear of an oppressive regime. Even an accused criminal deserves the justice of an unbiased trial and a fair sentence. Ultimately, our God is a God of justice. That's the point of Psalm 82. And it's God's plea to the nations of this world that they act justly. Justice is the heartbeat of our Lord. Justice comes in the form of salvation, where God restores a right relationship with God's people. Justice is continually shown to us by a God who is the father of orphans and the protector of widows. And yes, justice is even the act of God judging the earth and all the nations that belong to him, as demonstrated in the very last verse of Psalm 82. As people of God, we also define ourselves by our justice. But in our fight for justice, may we be slow to judge and quick to defend the powerless. May we seek salvation and restoration and redemption first and leave vengeance to the one who sits on the divine council. May we model the kind of justice displayed by Jesus, bringing good news to the poor, sight to the blind, proclaiming release for the captives and freedom for the oppressed. So although Psalm 82 is not one of the more popular psalms, it is an important text in our Bible because it demonstrates the heartbeat of God for justice. Yes, we might disagree on what that looks like, and yes, we might struggle to get our minds and our hearts around that concept, but it is absolutely critical for those who love God to try their best to understand it, and not only understand it, but do their best to seek justice in our lives, day in and day out, wherever we might find the ability to do so. Civil rights activist and Christian leader Martin Luther King Jr. is famously quoted as saying that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And he also says, whatever affects one person directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. And even what goes on in the highest heaven affects what goes on here on earth. 
So this psalm also gives the reasons why demonstrating justice is so very important. According to this psalm, when we neglect justice, it shakes the very foundations of the world. This is variously translated, all the foundations of the earth are shaken, the foundations of the earth are out of course, all earth's foundations slip, the world is shaken to the core, and graphically, everything's coming apart and the world's coming unglued. We cannot underestimate, according to the psalm, the danger of neglecting justice for the oppressed in this world. As Brent Strom writes, in this highly artful and poetic way, this poem unites heaven and earth by showing how what's done in the heaven's highest realms affect earth's lowly citizens. Another writer says the following, just what have the gods done that is so wrong? It's not so much what they have done as what they have not done. Now the scene shifts from the vastness of space to the smallest villages. Here live the poor and the weak and the orphans and the widows. The gods of those nations should have seen to it that these powerless were protected, but they have failed in their role. Therefore, the earth quakes, the foundations shake. So we might think that we can get away with not demonstrating justice, that no one will notice what we do or fail to do, but that is not the heartbeat of God. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, and it shakes the very foundations of the earth. In this psalm, when the other principalities and powers are judged by Yahweh, it is because they cannot escape the ways in which power blinds them to the need of the powerless. The powerful fail to understand. They walk in darkness because they are more concerned with their place in the heavenly court than with the needs of the people. The consequence of all this is nothing less than apocalypse. The world's foundations shake and God descends from the heavenly court and fresh off the judgment of the heavenly court also judges the world. Another writer says that when we fail to execute justice, the other leaders, uh, the, the other leaders fail to, failure to execute justice suggests that the very foundations of the world are shaken when this abuse of power takes place and darkness is lived into. Elsewhere in the Psalms, like Psalm 23, darkness is referred to as the valley of the shadow of death. This is a stark reminder that humanity has the ability either to bring about good or to bring about its opposite through the way that people govern and participate as citizens. In other words, people can force dark valleys upon others. And that's the sad truth, isn't it? People always are quite capable and actually quite good at forcing dark valleys upon others. But that is certainly not the will and the doing of God because the heartbeat of God is for justice and for each and every person to have, to have access to the kind of dignity and respect that belongs to all those who bear the image of God. And now it is up to us to do this in the world. One writer states that the message could not be more clear. Those with power including those with power in the spiritual realm, must use their power to help save and deliver the powerless. Some of us, or even most of us, may not feel particularly powerful. However, if we do have any privilege, and I would argue that given our place in this world, we do, then we should be using that privilege to help other people, not to shut them out. If this is the heartbeat of God, then it is imperative for those who say they love and follow God to do the same. Christian writer Glennon Doyle states this, this is one of my rememberings, she says, when I am at a table with people who have more privilege than I do, I speak up. And when I'm at a table with people who have less privilege than I do, I listen. Another writer observes that the point of this psalm wasn't that the priests and the prophets failed a confirmation quiz, as if they couldn't recite the Ten Commandments and the Great Shema. The point is that they are not attending to the core work of their faith. The prophet Hosea says, I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And finally, our psalm ends with a plea, as we have seen before as we studied the psalms, a plea for God to show up and to put right all the wrongs that have been done in the name of the other leaders, rulers, and principalities. The final words of this psalm are an ask. They are asking God to show up. Rise up, O God, and judge the earth, for the nations belong to you. 
One writer says this, the final plea is echoed by the petition that we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. He says, I will paraphrase, God, since you've shown your power in heaven by judging the unjust spiritual leaders and casting them down, how about doing the same on earth? Since all the nations belong to you, how about you show up and judge the earth as you have done in heaven? Another writer sees this last verse even more forcefully, saying the last line then takes its own admonishing character. O oh God above, come clean up the mess you've made. Come remedy the effects of the powerful. Come take responsibility for the world and its ills. Come rescue the plan that you set in motion. Come and be judged so that you might judge. Come and prove yourself worthy to rule. The last line of the psalm is a bold one. It is once a plea and an order. The cries of our deepest distress are always flecked with indignation and hopeful longing. The cries of our deepest distress are always flecked with indignation and hopeful longing because justice still does not happen on this earth and this world is not yet as it should be. And so we continue to pray, your kingdom come, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. Even so, Lord Jesus, come, we pray. So justice throughout this unjust world, that is our plea, even as we, who are now the hands and feet of Jesus, renew our efforts to do the same. As we close this morning, I wanted to share a prayer with you that's written based on this psalm. So as we close, would you bow with me in prayer? God of compassion, we gather to worship you, and as we do, we want to pray for all the vulnerable people, for the causes behind their susceptibility and the way in which that affects their lives. We come to to confess that often we have not even tried to become involved in changing people's environments or easing their distress. We confess that we make excuses to cover over blindness and deafness to people's needs and instead wait for someone else to offer up their help and to do the things that we should at least be attempting to do. Generous God, challenge us afresh to be your people now, in this time and this place, so that justice is not just a slogan, but an action carried out in love and sensitivity for God's people. God of all gentleness and grace, we praise you, even as we gather to pray for disadvantaged people. We come, too, to confess that we have often not tried to understand what are the needs of so many underprivileged people or why they are in that situation. We confess that we have not seen the world through their eyes or experienced the pain that they know all too well caused by bullying, racism, or unemployment, or how lack of knowledge and language skills makes life so difficult for many people. Healing God, confront us with the pain of these your people in need so that we can help to bring them healing, wholeness, dignity, and a sense of self-worth. God of justice and equality, today as we join with our fellow worshipers to share in their joys and concerns, we also want to seek your guidance on how best to serve you and the people in need. We confess that we become so involved with our own little concerns and trivial anxieties that we do not see what is often right in front of us, God's beloved children desperately in need of help. We confess that we have no idea what it means to be oppressed by powers that are beyond our reach and to be the victim of people with greedy or evil intentions. God of tenderness and warm acceptance, inspire and enable us to be filled with God's own compassion, tenderness, gentle care, and hope, so that we can be God's people who are caring for our brothers and sisters within God's great family. Because we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord God, we rejoice in your greatness and power, in your gentleness and love, in your mercy and justice. Enable us by your spirit to honor you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions, and to serve you in every aspect of our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Go in peace.